Warning, this episode contains discussion about abuse and certain abusive and coercive control techniques used in inpatient youth treatment facilities. If you or someone you love has been the victim of abuse, some of the information discussed could have the potential to be triggering for you. If you are a victim of abuse, we love you and you are not alone. Be sure you are in a good place mentally and emotionally before engaging with the content of this episode. Please stop listening and get support from a licensed mental health care provider if you feel triggered or overwhelmed by the discussion. Welcome to Hystericology with Andrea and Elizabeth. Today we have a guest that I am really excited to talk to, Jessica Black. We spoke a couple of years ago uh, about this topic, Mm -hmm. and since then you've been on my mind. I think we're really kindred spirits in this topic, and I think that you are doing incredible work in advocating and bringing awareness and shifting minds about the topic that we're going to talk about today. So I'll let you introduce yourself and the topic. Well, my name is Jessica Black, and I'm a clinical mental health counselor in Utah, and I specialize in play therapy and trauma. I also see couples um, through an EFT model, and um, I am doing a lot of work on the topic today, which is adolescent treatment centers. And I'm very excited to be a part of the conversation because I don't have experience either being in this type of treatment facility myself or working at one. I've only seen external conversations, so I'm super interested to hear from a variety of perspectives, uh, maybe where where we might be going wrong and how we're treating our teens and how we're going about trying to help them. Are you okay if I share a bit about what our conversation was about a few years ago? Sure. So Jessica had reached out to a number of us who had been to the same treatment center. I went to a treatment center when I was a teenager, an inpatient treatment center here in Utah. So if you've heard about all the work that Paris Hilton has been doing with the troubled teen industry, that's what we're talking about. These treatment centers that are legal here in Utah and really nowhere else. I think maybe Kansas. Is that the other state where they're legal? There are several states that quote unquote, get away with it. Hmm. Um, so there are a few treatment center or a few states that have adolescent treatment centers. Um, it's just depending on how they're marketed. Right. And at the level, so Utah is really known, um, from my experience working as a therapist at the treatment centers here in Utah, there's kids from other states who really just talk about being sent to Utah. Like that's what you don't want. If you're going through something, people will tease you about being sent away to Utah. It's a big, it's a big thing. We have a, it's a multi-million dollar industry here in Utah. So Jessica had reached out to several of us who had been to that same treatment center to ask us about our experiences in the long term, as far as effects from the trauma of going to that treatment center And there were multiple things in that conversation that were really enlightening to me because I didn't realize that so many other people were going through it in the same way. Mm -hmm. I'd really be interested to hear what did you gain from all of those interviews that you did and what path did that send you on? Um, I gained a lot of information um, and I noticed a lot of similarities and uh It led me, at first I wanted to write a book about my experience, and then it kind of morphed into advocacy and awareness and education. So my goal now is to educate therapists about what's going on in these treatment centers and how to better address the issues that they're sending kids away for. Um, I'm also hoping to somehow establish a better model for adolescent treatment centers that uh, is going to help kids. Uh, And what I noticed was a lot of uh, trauma that happened in the treatment center. Um, They're 
countless people that didn't really have trauma going in, but came out with a lot of it. Um, that wasn't really apparent at first, but 5, 10, 15 years later became incredibly apparent to them. So for you, was that kind of the trigger point of going, wait a minute, something feels off here? Or what was the first maybe experience you had where it started to click of, I, I don't know how I feel about what we're doing here? So I knew when I was in grad school that something was weird. Um, I couldn't put my finger on it. I didn't know exactly what it was. I did a lot of research on uh, adolescent group therapy just in general, um, which we know actually doesn't help. Um, there's plenty of research about that. Uh, you know, the the god of group therapy, Yalom, will even tell you in his books that adolescent group therapy uh, doesn't really have great results. In a nutshell, for those who might go, wait a minute, I don't believe what you're saying. Mm -hmm. In a nutshell, why doesn't it work? Or why do we understand that it doesn't work? So there's a couple of reasons. The first one is developmental. Um, there's pros and cons to that. Some people think, well, no, it's good because they're around their peers and there's a very big peer influence. You know, that should help. However, we know that teenagers are at different developmental levels all the time. Regardless of how old they are, it's not necessarily an age thing. It's an experience thing. And so, for example, you can't have a kid in there that has never had sex with another kid who that's kind of like their main issue. That's not going to be helpful to the other kid. The other aspect to why it doesn't help is we all know it just gives kids better ways to lie or like more stuff to do, um, you know, better drugs to try, you know, experiences like, oh, I've never been to a party or a rave. Like now I want to go there. Um, so it, it can be helpful, I, but I think it's in a structured setting when it's not a process group. Um, it's more of a psycho ed group or a skills training group. Those actually have been found effective, but process groups, um, which is happening a lot in treatment centers, don't have good results. What I found is that um, a lot of just in culture happens within those groups where, of course, they all know each other and they live with each other 24-7. And so there's a lot of hierarchical things that are happening and there's a lot of conforming. There's a lot of fronting. Obviously, they're teenagers. They're trying to find their identity. And at this point in this kind of uh, tiny little micro society, all they have is each other. And that number changes depending on which treatment center it, it is. But maybe they have maybe 20 or 50 other kids that they're interacting with on a regular basis for months and months and months and months at a time. They don't have access to their friends, their family for the most part. So this is, this is it. And they sleep in shared rooms with these people and this is their life. And then there's also the pressure of the behavioral modification program that they're engaging in with the treatment center and quote unquote, like looking good for that. So there's the game that they have to play in order to look right in front of the therapist and in front of the staff to be able to move forward in the program. And that's pretty much all groups turn into. From my experience, you can, you can have kids that are doing great in individual therapy, but are going to stare at the floor the entire time during group because they're not about to, you know, get trashed by the other kids later in the day when you're not around. Or you can have kids who are really trying to, to put on the right face and they're being called posers. And, you know, it's, it just, the culture doesn't provide for any kind of meaningful anything to happen in these groups. A big part of that is it's forced therapy. Mm -hmm. This is not consensual. In everyday outpatient therapy, we don't see people that aren't consenting to therapy. Yeah. Um, so why do we do that in residential? And why does that happen, do you think? Why has it taken that turn that these facilities aren't just filled with adolescents who are choosing to be there or understand why they're there, why does the industry tend to lean on some of these really aggressive practices of 
sometimes even abducting children in the night with their parents' permission. Why does that happen? Because that's where it started. It's always been that way. Residential for adolescents has never been consensual. If you look at history of residential treatment centers for teens, it will go back to, you look in the 80s especially, a facility uh, called Straight, Straight Inc. Um, It was never consensual. It was forced. And every treatment center since then has some connection to Straight, which was subsequently shut down because it was abusive. And a lot of the tactics that are used in teen residential treatment centers would never be used in an adult treatment center um, because it would be abusive. Yeah. Sometimes even literally physical abuse. I interviewed several therapists and staff who had worked at various treatment centers and heard stories of therapists and staff physically and sexually abusing the kids at these treatment centers and other staff members reporting it to the authorities, reporting it to the licensing departments, and um, nothing ever happened to a vast majority of these places. Is it such a, my theory is that it's, it's a really big money maker for the state or in general. So a lot of things just end up sliding under the rug And it's really complicated. You get a professional and they're saying, well, this kid's making stuff up because they're mentally ill. And that's a really easy case. It's it's just the longest standing form of institutionalization. I mean, we say that institutions ended, but they didn't. They are alive and well in the teen treatment industry. Mm -hmm. Very much so. Yeah, in the 1950s is when they kind of went towards that deinstitutionalization. That's when they shut down a lot of state hospitals and mental hospitals and things like that. Um, and that is quickly when treatment centers for adolescents began. Kind of these covert institutionalization, that happening just under a different name. And for you and the research that you've done, why did straight and why have other programs erred, do you think, on the side of heavy-handedness rather than getting that buy-in, rather than getting that agreement uh, and starting the treatment from there, a place of collaboration? Why why have they resorted to this heavy-handed tactic of forcing against teens' will? Well, I think that there's a couple of things. Um, The first one is kind of that old-school mentality of fix my kid very much of they're the problem, they're acting out, they're out of control, not understanding basic development of a teenager. As well as family systems. And family systems. So that kind of old school thinking has just continued. And to, you know, older therapists, people have been, you know, people have been doing this since the 80s. It sounds good. It sounds right. Um, You know, send them to a boot camp. That's going to straighten them out scare them straight. That has been the mentality for treating kids for decades. And then the that's one of the issues. And then the second one is there's no regulations. There's no one coming into these treatment centers and telling them, hey, you can't do that. There's zero federal regulations, some state regulation. And even then, having worked in the treatment center, I know how to get around it. I know how to get around the regulations. I know the right words to say. That's all that you do. And so those are kind of the two issues as to like why it's like that. And no adolescent is going to agree to residential. (laughs) No no one's going to be be plucked from their life and from their friends. No kid is going to be like, you know what? Absolutely. Take me away. Um, I can't watch TV. I can't call my friends. I can't talk to my parents. I can't read the newspaper. Yes, please. Admit me. Especially with fully informed consent. Mm Because there, I have encountered a couple teens who did go in voluntarily, but they had no idea what it was actually going to be like, that their rights were going to be just totally taken away from them, and that they were going to be stuck there. Mm -hmm. They thought maybe a few weeks, Mm -hmm. not 18 months, not Mm -hmm. two years. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're not given full consent uh, or information. To me... In general outside concern, it feels like an extension even legally in the legal system and family court of children being treated as property, 
children not being honored, whether they're a young child or an adolescent, that they are a human being and they have rights. This idea that because their informed consent would be difficult to achieve, well, let's just force them. Correct. And that you're basically the property of your parents. That's mm-hmm. how the legal system treats you. Mm-hmm. And so we can force you to go there. Mm-hmm. We can force you to have these invasive cavity searches or have to, as we were talking about, and it would be interesting to talk about, recite interesting, you know, mm-hmm. <laughs> power and control inducing mantras. Why is that so damaging to start treatment from this place of coercion and and forcing and compelling these children to engage. What does that do to the human psyche? Well, depending on like your therapeutic orientation, right? Um, yeah, from your perspective. Mine is I very much believe in the power of the relationship um, with my clients. There has to be trust there. Part of the stages of change, right, is that I can meet the client where they're at. And so when you lie to the person or the kid, about it, and you're lying the whole time. They're not going to be honest with you either. So the idea that they're going to change is ridiculous. That's not going to work. Yeah, yeah it's um, almost asking someone who's like been, if they've been abducted from anybody, a Stockholm syndrome type situation is maybe I'll trust or I'll feign to a certain degree, but how could you ever cultivate true trust from a place of trauma? Correct. And it come, it goes back to they'll conform. They'll conform. They'll fake it. They'll put on a face because they're trying to get out. They're not trying to get better. They're trying to get out. And how often are these tactics, in from your perspective, an extension of what they're experiencing at home? Because as we're talking about, and myself as a, as a doctor of marriage and family therapy, family systems thinking, understanding that sending your child away and expecting them to be fixed well, they weren't the genesis of the issues in the first place. You're going to, and we know this, you send them back home, they're going to fall right back into the old behaviors because it's a systems problem, not the child. Often they even are the scapegoat. They are the most sensitive one in the family that won't allow the masking to happen in the family. So uncomfortable with them being so overtly demonstrating the dysfunction of the family through their behaviors. How often are you noticing that the abuse of the treatment centers and how they manage care, quotations, air quotations, that that's reflective of what these kids are already experiencing to some degree at home. The secret keeping, the being compelled into presenting a certain way. Well, I think there's absolutely aspects of home um, in the treatment center, and then they're only capitalized on. Um, so it's not a lot, it's not very different. You know, I still can't trust this person, I still can't trust my caregiver. I'm still unsafe. These people around me don't actually care about me because they're punishing me. I'm the identified patient. I'm the problem. That's the message that these kids are getting. So psychologically, in your formative years, your brain is still forming. Through adolescence, you begin with a message of you are a problem. And that doesn't go away Yeah, when they're spending two years in this place, which we know that is not good. (laughs) There is irreparable attachment trauma that happens when a child is in a placement for more than three months. Um, We know that through the foster care system. There's been research on that. We know that. However, again, there are no regulations. There is no minimum or maximum that you can keep a child in residential. And there is a a lot of research that shows that the teen years are really important for attachment. We think of the baby years and the toddler years as being the attachment years, but teen years are vital for being able to develop the secure attachment throughout lifetime. So it makes, it makes no sense from so many modalities, a trauma modality where you can't start trauma treatment by non-consensually traumatizing somebody, right? Well, we're going to force you here. There was even a girl in my treatment center that I went to who had been tased in order to get her to the treatment center. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, who gave the transporters the right to do that in the beginning? And how was that ever okayed? And then how is she expected 
to go to this treatment center having been tackled, having been tased, and then do any kind of beneficial work. So from a trauma perspective, from an attachment perspective, from a uh, you know, developing a therapeutic relationship perspective from so many different theoretical orientation that has have a lot of research behind them. What these treatment centers are doing are the opposite of beneficial. They're just a placeholder. Yeah, for some reason, there's a mentality that only bad kids go to treatment centers. These are really hard kids, right? But they're not. They They just have attachment issues or they have major depression, they have no coping skills, they have poor parenting, they have no communication, they're autistic. So many different things that are sending kids to treatment centers that it's not that they're hard kids. I've never really met a hard kid. When you were saying before we started recording, you were talking about even just the process of children almost it being jumped to sending them to these really intensive treatment environments when you were saying there were kids who hadn't even seen an outpatient therapist how commonly did that happen where it didn't there didn't seem to be these appropriate levels of care ensuring that if they were put in this type of intensive environment that was really warranted how how often is that happening where people are leaping to that I would say a lot. I, I would say the majority of kids that are sent here um, or sent to treatment centers have not seen a therapist. They may have seen a school counselor or an education consultant. Or a psychiatrist. Or a psychiatrist. But the educational consultant, I want to talk more about that because that's something that I didn't realize until I was working in treatment centers as a therapist is that the, these educational consultants, so the same branch of work that helps people get their kids into certain colleges, helps parents place their kids into residential treatment centers, centers as well. And the residential treatment centers, that's one of their main ways that they network and advertise, is developing these relationships with these educational consultants who then advertise themselves to parents as being able to find them a solution for their troubled teen. And that blew my mind that parents aren't even necessarily looking for these options. The educational consultants kind of act as that front-end salesman, helping them and then get some level of commission or payback for whoever they refer to the treatment center. Well, and it's much easier to talk to parents about school than mental health. So it's, oh, this boarding school, this this sounds great. You know, you're going to ride horses and, you know, do all of these things. And then it's not about the child's mental health issues, but I'll talk to you about, oh yeah, your kids are, your, your kids' grades are failing and um, we should, we should do something about that. Why don't we look at this therapeutic school? Do parents ever really receive a true picture of what's happening because that's something as I've even been looking into this a little more in knowing that we were going to talk to you today is we often I know myself sometimes could even feel like those damn parents they created these issues in a sense not to be too simplistic about it and now here they are blaming their child and sending them away I know most of the time parents most parents seem to really love their children even if they're not equipped with the right skills to help them but Parents also seem to be being victimized through how these programs are being marketed. Because if I'm a parent and I'm truly concerned about my child and based on my capabilities, I feel like I am not able to rein in whatever behaviors are really scaring me. If I'm talking to an educational consultant and their first thing isn't saying, hey, have you gotten them in to see someone? Just start getting them talking to a therapist and finding them a good fit. But the first thing is there is this great boarding school. There's this great treatment program. And like you said, they're talking up all of those beautiful little elements, like you said, that working there, you can make it sound great, but you're not telling them about, oh yeah, and if they get too rough when we're trying to abduct them at night, we might just tase them. Or if they're bad, then they get to be in isolation for a month. Yeah, horrible torture, literal emotional torture. How much are parents, do you think, willing participants in the abuse versus truly they're not even receiving appropriate informed consent. I have not found a parent that actually knew what was going on. Wow. 
Um, parents, you know, even when they're coming to a therapist, they are desperate. They are scared. They're trusting the professionals. So when a professional therapist looks them in the eye and says, your kid needs to be here or they're going to die, any parent would say, oh my gosh, yes. Um, Because they're trusting that these professionals know what they're talking about. But I mean, as we know, we can't predict any of that. Um, We can't predict behavior, especially if we're looking at an adolescent. Because again, they're trying to form their identity and I'm going to be gothic today and you know, tomorrow I'm just going to be a preppy. Like, uh, we can't judge their outcome on how they're behaving now. But when parents come to these education consultants or a therapist or a psychiatrist, they're scared. So therefore they're more vulnerable to being suggestive, saying, hey, this is going to help your kid. This is going to help your family. You're going to get your kid back. Yeah. And there's so much manipulation throughout the entire process. So it's starting with the educational consultant. And then there's the admissions professional. And they, from what I could tell, just lie straight up about the entire thing, what it's going to look like, everything. And then they usually have a couple of kids who are about to graduate from the program speak to the parents as well and talk to them about how great the program was and how much their life has changed. But of course, these kids are also trying to get out. These aren't kids who have graduated and now they're just voluntarily coming back to have these conversations with parents. So they're conforming to what the treatment center wants. And then the kid comes to the treatment center and the kid never has alone time with their parent to be able to talk with them. In the treatment center that I went to, um, the parents would come. They, it was mostly local uh, pa- parents, which the treatment center that I worked at, most of them were out of state. So they'd fly in every now and then. The treatment center that I went to was mostly local parents. And we they would come every Thursday for maybe an hour. And we were instructed not to even make eye contact with them because wow. we might manipulate them with our eyeballs, um, which was ridiculous. And then we had seven minutes with them to basically apologize to them. And that was it. We could hug them as long as our face was facing a staff member so they could make sure we weren't whispering. We couldn't call home. We couldn't write home. We couldn't contact anybody at all. And the treatment center that I worked at, they had family sessions over Zoom and they could call their parents, I think twice a week, but they were being watched by staff while they were calling their parents. So there's no way for them to say anything. And if they do, then you have the therapist, you have the staff members, you have everyone reassuring them that their kid is fine, their kid is safe, but they're acting out. And this is a natural part of treatment and that they're going to, you know, they're going to settle in and it's okay. They're just being manipulative right now. Wow. How did that, how did that feel to go through that? To have to put on that front and be so heavily controlled and not feel like you could actually communicate what was going on for you. It felt exactly like what you were saying before, like a continuation of every way that I had always had already learned how to mitigate and adapt to my life. And then I was in this center where I, I had to learn how to play a different game, but I just had to learn how to play the game. It's very isolating. Um, That's part of the the control process is isolation. Um, Coercive control, if if you know about that. It is not a physical control. You know, one thing that we used to say at the treatment center I worked at was our doors are unlocked. They weren't locked in. It was coercive control. It was mind control. It was very much a emotional manipulation. And so these parents are told from the beginning, do not believe anything that your child says to you. They are trying to manipulate you. They're just trying to get out. They just want to go back to their druggy lifestyle, whatever. So don't believe anything that they say. So immediately there is a severe isolation and they're pitting parents against their children. I haven't found a treatment center where that doesn't happen. Wow. I have not found a place where kids are allowed to talk to their parents whenever they want without supervision. What does that do to someone's 
psyche to reinforce this sense that you always have to be looking over your shoulder. You don't have control over what you're saying or this hyper control over every action, every move, every word. And like you're saying, maybe if that kid even gets some message out to the family, but don't believe what it's what's said. What does that do to a person long-term? So from the interviews that I've done, a very, very common theme from these people that haven't been in treatment for 10, 20, 30 years, there is a constant feeling of getting in trouble. Guilty complex. Even when they're not doing anything, even when they're full-grown adults, your boss saying, hey, I just need to talk to you real quick. Immediately, I'm going to get in trouble. They're, she's going to fire me. Oh my gosh. Which takes away any ability for you to never feel like you're, well, you're always going to feel like you're in a one-down position well, in every it, relationship. Constant hypervigilance which we know with cortisol levels and things like that, that's not good for the body um, to be so hypervigilant. It's also causing anxiety when you have to be hyper aware of every single thing that you're saying. You have to be so careful about the words you use and how you use them. Because if you say one thing wrong, you lose a level. You get demerits. You can't talk to your parents for a week almost feels like there's no room for any type of error. There's no room to be human. Right. Or to be yourself. And you mentioned earlier as well that one of the but the things that stems from it is feeling like there's something wrong with me. I'm bad. I'm the problem. I'm the root of all of the issues. And that lingers for a very long time, forever, if it's not healed in one way or another. And then beyond that, there's a lack of a sense of identity. Because if you're just performing and the only time that you are accepted, the only time that your family will consider bringing you back into their lives or that you're moving forward in these levels is if you are performing as the person they want, then who are you? And is who you are okay? The answer is no, really. And you don't know who you are. And then even after you get out, it's you don't want to go back in. So you, you just try your hardest to toe the line and behave in the way that you're supposed to behave so that you don't go back. And it turns into this really long journey of trying to figure out who am I and is it even okay to get in touch with who I am because obviously who I am is just really incredibly bad. Yes, that's the message that you get um, or that you give the kid. You send them away. You're the problem. I'm fine as a parent. You have issues. You need to go fix yourself. They are the identified patient and therefore will be treated as such. And so what happens to many of these individuals when they're sent back home and there's been no work? They've been traumatized. They've, in a sense, been scared into strengthening their mask and their ability to just perform according to what they think is expected. What happens when we're not involving families in the process and identifying the systemic dysfunction or malfunction? Are there any long-term positive gains? Because thus far, as we're identifying, there's a lot of long-term trauma and pain. I'm wondering, do people sustain any benefit from those types of programs where they're just the problem, they're fixed, and now you're back in life performing? I think that it's mixed because when you come out, you're a true believer you believe that that place saved your life. You need to be grateful for that place. You are so lucky to have been there. It saved your life. And then Andrea, as, as she was saying about, you don't want to go back. So it's not that you are better. It's that you're acting better because you're afraid. It is complete fear-based. Can relationships seem better? Sure. And a lot of times people will continue the act um, because that's what they're supposed to do. And then there, but there's always this underlying feeling that just something's off. Something is not right. It, it just feels weird. And, you know, what I have found is a lot of people in their recovery process, recovery from the treatment center is them finding themselves and and doing work that they realize like, oh, I was just a kid. 
I was just an asshole teenager, like what teenagers are supposed to be. (laughs) (laughs) And, you know, even now when I have a parent in my office talking about their teenager and they say they're out of control, my response is, are they out of control or are they out of your control? Mm -hmm. Because there's a difference. Yeah. As little kid and and parent, it's I understand it's a very difficult transition, um, and parents have to go through that transition as well from having a an eight nine ten year old kid, and then all of a sudden they have this fourteen year old that won't listen to them, won't do their homework, uh, won't answer their phone, is wants to be with their friends all the time. What we know about development is like actually that's what they're supposed to do, and it's more about. It, at least in outpatient, what I've been doing is I don't really see the teenager. I see the parents. And it's not about the kid. It's about the, how the parents are reacting to the kid. And so when you are just focused on the kid all the time, then that's the message that is sent. And as Andrea said, it it carries throughout your life. They carry this constant feeling that they are a problem. And I feel like it's kind of half and half with sometimes those those kids just continue the the game. Sometimes they get worse. When I the kind of research that I've noticed is that the kids that go in to treatment that have already experienced trauma and come out with more trauma will get worse. The kids that don't have like a lot of traumatic experiences or super dysfunctional homes are then traumatized in treatment and then come out of treatment and they're mm, they're okay but they're still not having a full sense of their identity they're still not given an opportunity to know and find themselves and be accepted and loved by their families no matter what. When I feel like it, it sets those people, those adolescents up to model the behavior they've experienced. Maybe not only the dysfunctional behavior from their families, but if you're almost shown like, it's okay that we treated you this way because look, the ends justify the means. You appear to be better. And so if we engaged in emotional abuse, if we engaged in physical abuse, if we used coercion and fear and control, yeah, that's okay to use. If you feel like your ends justify that, or that's okay for you to experience that from other people. So it feels like it almost sets people up to either model that, perpetrate abuse, or on the other end of that, be willing to allow others to treat them in abusive ways because, hey, it was normalized. The treatment facility did that. My therapist did that. Or my my parents co-signed on that. And I'm guessing some of these kids, they don't have necessarily the insight to recognize, my parents don't know everything going on here. That's probably part of where the secret keeping comes in too. We don't really want the families knowing what's happening. We act like it's don't trust your kids because your kids are liars. But it's we don't want the children telling you what's happening. And if they tell you, we want you to think they're lying Because if the parents really knew what was going on, would they keep their child there? Would that source of income continue to be there? Oh, it makes me angry. It makes me angry to think about it. And I know you were sharing a little bit about your experience in that. And I'm wondering, do you, and you can tell me if you don't want to answer it, do you feel fully healed from your experience? That's a really complicated question. Um, but I think a, a really valid question. I feel like a whole person at this point in my life, which is which is good. Huge progress. I feel anger towards the treatment industry. I feel anger towards you know the the decision makers in in creating my time there. Um, and anger towards that I've I've never really had gotten any answers as to why. I went there from anybody. That's really frustrating. I've talked to, you know, all of my parents separately and nobody really has a solid answer for me. So there's there's these holes. But that's not the only area of my life that I have, you know, holes, right? Um, as far as what happened there. So there's a sense of loss, sadness, anger there. But I don't know that that's 
something that can't happen from a healed place. Uh, I do notice that there's some things that I just still don't do. I, after Jessica and my interview a few years ago, I realized, uh, I think because of one of the questions you asked me, that I don't journal at all. Mm. I don't write things down. And I have terrible handwriting. And I think part of that is intentionally so that people can't read what I'm writing. Wow. Bingo. Yep. Do you want to talk more about that, Jessica? Sure. So a lot of times in um, adolescent treatment centers, again, it's forced therapy, but in the one that Andrea was in, they were required to write a quote unquote moral inventory every Every single night. night. Wow. And it's in a model of the 12 steps. You can trace back moral inventory to straight ink, um, which then goes to the seed and way far back. Anyway, um, I don't need to get into that. And so what happens is that when you are forced to do something every day, you no longer want to do that anymore. And not just that, but these, uh, they're kind of like, I guess you could say they're kind of like journal entries, but they are read by staff, by your peers. Um, So it's invasive. Very invasive. You are not allowed to keep a journal. Um, You're not allowed to have any kind of privacy. And it can be read at any time. Some In some other facilities, they do something called OBS or observation, where you have to write essentially essays. And you're required to write these essays for days at a time until you can, you know, get off the the consequence. So there are a lot of writing assignments that in outpatient or, you know, individual counseling we want our clients to do, but the the people that have gone to treatment often cannot, will not do writing. They won't journal. They won't do any kind of therapeutic assignment where they have to write. So it's been, in a sense, weaponized. It's been used as a punishment. Therapy is weaponized. Yeah, the entire experience. Most of these people will never go to therapy again, Mm -hmm. ever. And it seems like, too, with all of these invasive behaviors, not allowing anyone a private space, a private moment, as far as I understand, in some of these facilities, if not all of them, people are supervised when they shower, when they go to the bathroom. I personally don't know why that is that that happens. I don't know if it's because of self-harm potential or I don't know, you guys might have a sense of, of why that happens, but where when you can't even go to the bathroom or take a shower and be alone. And in some cases I've heard people of, uh, you know, the opposite sex or males watching females having to shower, go to the bathroom or vice versa. It, it's invasive nonetheless, but you don't have any private spaces for you, not even your journal. I can imagine, like you said, therapy, of course, it's just become a weapon. Why would you ever voluntarily engage in it? Why did you become a therapist after going into a treatment facility? I actually, so my parents had a just horrifically messy divorce. Um, They divorced when I was two and we were in court pretty much straight about one thing or another until I was literally 17 and a half, which is when I got out of treatment. So we, I had been to various therapists, none of which you had ever been beneficial in any way, shape or form. I remember playing in a sand tray at some point, but like never actually being spoken to by the therapist or drawing pictures and having those analyzed. But again, no one ever talking to me. Um, Just these various experiences ending in this treatment center that I went to. And just being so upset because I needed help. I was not okay. And none of them had helped me. So I wanted to be, you know, become a therapist who helped, actually helped. But then I found that it's a trap. 